Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I have as my guest, Wendy Weiss. She is the founder of Salesology, which is a prospecting method. She helps companies to increase the quality and quantity of qualified uh, sales appointments, which then in turn drives sales. We're going to be exploring some of the perennial problems that we both see. How do we teach sellers to prospect? What, why is it that what they're doing isn't working? And you know, getting to the root cause so that you can solve those problems. Because prospecting is a very, very different set of skills to actually running a sale. Unless you understand what prospects want, how they talk about it, then chances are you're just going to show up and throw up and talk about your product, which is the equivalent of showing photos of your ugly children to strangers and wondering why they aren't uh, as excited as you are. So, Wendy, welcome. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Excellent. Okay, well, let, let's start with 60 to 90 seconds on your history. You know, what qualifies you to uh, teach people how to prospect? Okay, well. Thank you for that question. And I'll just begin by saying I was never, ever supposed to be a sales trainer. Um, I was actually supposed to be a ballerina. I uh, grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, of course, it was everyone. <laughs> and, um, you know, I danced with uh, Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. I danced with the Cincinnati Ballet. And as you probably know, ballet is one of the most difficult and exacting art forms. Yep. And I got into my current career uh, by accident because I needed a day job. And I got a job with a telemarketing agency that did business development. Turned out I was good at it, which was a complete surprise because <laughs> ballet dancers don't talk. We right. dance. We don't talk. So I did that day job for a while. And actually, one of my first clients, I, st I started my own business then when I, I had clients that I'd represent. I did business development for them. It was uh, actually one of my first clients dubbed me the queen of cold calling because I found so many opportunities for him. And from there, I segued into the business that I have today. The business that I have today, my company, we work with sales teams, often underperforming sales teams, and we turn that around by teaching them to prospect, to build a pipeline of opportunities, qualified opportunities, faster, more easily, and more profitably. Well, the, this then speaks to another really important and sad feature of the modern times. I saw a statistic last year that said only 13% of sales teams were hitting their quota in, entirely. And this year, the number I've been hearing is around 3%. Now, it's hard, you'd be hard pushed to find one that is performing on that basis. And I'm um, uh, incredibly concerned that we are probably in the third generation of sales manager who doesn't know how to prospect and doesn't know how to teach their people to prospect. So if you're advising senior executives, founders, owners, what advice would you give them when it comes to hiring and developing your management layer so that your salespeople are fit for purpose? Is the key question, isn't it? Uh -huh. This is what I see. So many companies hire new salespeople and then they teach them every last thing that they need to know about whatever it is they're selling, which can take a really long time. They may even invest in uh, sales training, but Lots of times sales training doesn't teach prospecting. It starts with the idea that you're in front of a, an opportunity, you're in front of the prospect, how do you handle yourself? So this process of hiring someone, teaching them everything, and then maybe teaching them uh, how to ask good questions, it takes a really long time. And I saw a study about a a couple of weeks ago that said 83% of newly hired salespeople are gone in three years. They either quit or you've had to let them go because they're not producing. I'm stunned it's that low, actually. <laughs> I'm amazed that it's not more because I, more often than not, what you see is this revolving door. It keeps speaking back to problems upstream. And this is, this is one of the big frustrations that I have, that um, most management and most leadership is fixated on trying to solve the symptom 
instead of address the cause. I have clients, sometimes they'll say to me, they have somebody uh, that, you know, they're just not closing. And then when I take a look at what this person is doing, they're not closing because they're not prospecting properly. (laughs) So they're not talking to the right people who are likely to buy. That happens so often. So this then begs the question, why is it people don't ask, well, why isn't it working? And instead of doing that, they double down on stupid and they just increase the volume and stuff and treat it like a numbers game. Yeah. Well, it is a numbers game, but it's not a numbers game the way people talk about it. The idea is not more appointments, more appointments, more appointments. The idea is qualified appointments with talking to the right people. I'll give you a really concrete example. I had a conversation with a client recently who told me they they were an insurance agency and he had a fairly new insurance salesperson who was getting a whole lot of appointments. And and my client said to me, but he has a closing problem. He's not closing. So I asked some questions. Well, it turned out that this young man moonlighted in a bar. And he was making appointments to discuss insurance with everyone that came in the bar. These were not qualified <laughs> appointments. People didn't show up. They, they didn't really want insurance. But he was getting a lot of appointments because he served them the drink and say, hey, you want to get together and talk about your insurance? And they'd say, sure. Mm-hmm. So okay. that was so the prospecting problem, not a closing problem. That then raises uh, another question about the qualities of the human being that makes a great prospector. If you were designing the ideal prospector, what would would their qualities, their values, their motivations look like? Well, the ideal prospector, first of all, has to have some talent for this, but talent alone is not enough. Think of all the talented athletes that have never made it to the Olympics. They have to be willing to learn their craft. Bottom line, this is a craft. This is a skill set. There is the myth of the born salesperson that somehow Mm. there are these people out there. They're just born knowing what to do and knowing what to say. You you pop out your mother's womb and say, interesting question, mom. Why do you ask? (laughs) (laughs) That happened never. (laughs) Exactly. And, um, you know, Because of my background as a dancer, I'm going to quote Anna Pavlova. Anna Pavlova was one of the great Russian ballerinas of the late 19th and early 20th century. She danced with the Imperial Russian Ballet. She danced with Ballet Diaghilev. She was the first ballerina to tour the world with her own company. Anna Pavlova trained for eight years at the Imperial Russian Ballet School. Had she not done that, she would never have been able to do all the things that she did. Yep. And Anna Pavlova very famously said, no one arrives from talent alone. Work transforms talent into genius. Anna Pavlova was born with a whole lot of talent to dance. Then she trained for eight years in her craft so that she could go on and have that career. Yep. You may have hired someone that's born with a whole lot of talent. They need to learn their craft and it will not take them eight years to do it. It takes eight years to train a ballet dancer. You can train someone to set qualified appointments. Someone who has no experience in your industry at all, you can train them to set up qualified appointments for you, for someone on your team that knows what they're doing. You can do that in two, maybe three months. We do it all the time. Okay. So again, one of the things that I see happening in many organizations, particularly within technology, is um, they don't really give them new hires enough of a ramp up period. And they just throw them in at the deep end uh, and then they burn through them. So you end up with this revolving door and the sales floor littered with the corpses of um, salespeople who fail. In fact, what's really depressing is I think it was, was it 22% of new hires leave within 42 days. That's one fifth, over a fifth disappear within 42 days. Now that's a terrifying waste when you consider the opportunity cost because that now sets you back and you've burnt through money, time, management time, all that kind of stuff. So 
looking at the ideal prospector, um, what kind of, uh, how do they turn up? Let's start with that. Let's turn up with mindset and intent. What does a great prospector turn up with in terms of mindset and intent? That's such an interesting question. and I never thought about it in exactly those terms. The mindset, you know, people say a lot of really, just really stupid things about this topic. They uh, say that it is about just toughening up and learning to deal with rejection. They say it's about going through people saying no to you and hanging up on you to get to somebody that's saying yes. They say it's a numbers game. Usually what they mean is dial the phone 100 times a day. And if that doesn't work, you're not getting traction, dial the phone 200 times a day and so on. And all of these things that people believe about prospecting are just not true. I have an ongoing uh, disagreement with a colleague of mine who says the skill in prospecting is knowing what to say so the prospect, uh, when the prospect says no which to me is crazy because I think the skill is in knowing what to say so that they say, yes, this is a skill set. And if you approach it in that manner, there are certain things you need to have in place to train your people so that they can learn this skill set. And a lot of the conversation about prospecting is everybody hates it, but then there's like some people that love it, which is kind of a dumb conversation. The idea is not that you love this. The idea is that you're neutral, that you want your salespeople to be neutral. It's not an emotional experience. It's a business process by which you acquire prospects, potential opportunities, period. That's it. That's a really, really interesting insight that prospecting shouldn't be an emotional experience. That I really like that. So I shall be stealing it and you'll get credit at least once. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. So this is really interesting because uh, one, one of the lessons I learned is that you re- people reflect back what you project out. Yes. Um, and how you show up on that call, I've found to be really very, very important. Now, I agree with you, but you, know, you should be neutral. And the ones that sound like Tigger immediately creates uh, resistance because you know it's a sales call. So instantly the defense walls go up and you're trying to get the clown off the phone. And the next words out of their mouth prove why you should. So let's then talk about the opening moments of the call. Okay, let's do that. Um, Don't say, how are you today? May I have a moment of your time? Is this a good time for us to talk or anything like that? I am a big believer in just getting to the point. Maybe it's because I live in New York City. I don't know. (laughs) When you reach out to a prospect for the first time and they don't know who you are, there are two things that they want to know. And that is, who are you? What do you want? Yeah. So have an introduction. Um, and for all you managers out there, what this means is you need to have scripts for your people. They need to have an elevator speech. They need to have a way to introduce themselves quickly that's going to resonate with the type of prospect they're reaching out to. And that's not about what you or your product or your service does. It's about how your clients are better off after you finish doing all the things that you do. And I'd like to comment, Marcus, for for a moment on this idea of scripts, because every time I say the word scripts, salespeople and managers go, oh my God, I don't want to have scripts. I don't want my people to use scripts. That's terrible. So I'm going to let you all in on a little secret. All of your salespeople are already using scripts. <laughs> and this is what I mean. They probably have a way they introduce themselves right yeah, now in elevator patter. speech. Yeah. yeah, it's their pattern. It's the pattern. It may yeah. not be written down, but if they're saying the same thing over and over again, that's the script. Yeah. They probably have questions they hear, objections they hear, they have a standard answer. That's the script. Mm-hmm. So the question is not, should we have scripts? Because you, you people have scripts. The right question is, do the scripts that they are using work? 
And I would add to that, do they sound natural? Because the, the real problem I have with scripts is you sound canned. If it doesn't sound natural, then automatically it, uh, it doesn't fill me with comfort. And I think the first thing we as salespeople need to do is create the conditions where the other person doesn't see us as a reason for their amygdala to go off. Right. Well, part of the training and prospecting is having that script and learning how to use it. You watch TV, you watch the news anchors. They are reading from a teleprompter all the time. They sound like yeah. they're talking. It is a completely yeah. learnable skill. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is not you have a script, hello, sir or madam, may I have a moment of your time? That's not a script. The idea is it's a guideline, the points you want to make, how you're going to get someone's attention. And I would argue if uh, prospects, if, you're, if your sales team is not getting enough qualified appointments, if prospects are saying, I'm not interested in hanging up the phone, your scripts don't work. And it's probably you're neither timely, relevant, or bringing value to them. If you're interrupting my day, at least bring me some value. So this then raises the other question around research, because there are two quite polarized schools of thought in the prospecting world. One is that you do your research so that when you go in, you're relevant then you're playing a game as a sniper. Uh, the other is you do no research and you just barrel through 10,000 names and dial for dollars. And at the end of it, hopefully some of the mud will stick. Well, I'm kind of in the middle of those two things because I define prospecting as a appointment setting. Let me give you my definition of the word appointment. The prospect agrees to have an in-depth conversation. That's it. Maybe you're going to get in your car and go see them. Maybe you're going to do it all over the phone or on a Zoom call, but the prospect agrees to have the conversation. Prospecting is like dating. Yeah. You want to go on a date with someone, you've got to ask them. Then you go on the date. <laughs> prospecting is like asking for the date. So the preparation to do that is, and managers, you need to have these things in place for your people, a very clear micro-targeted definition of who they're looking for. What makes an ideal prospect for you in your market with your offering? And you want it to be very narrowly focused because when you do that, it's easier to find them. It's easier to create the messaging that's going to resonate, which makes it much more likely to get a qualified appointment. And because it's a qualified appointment, it makes it so much easier to then close the opportunity. So that's the first thing. Um, Hallelujah. When you're trying to set an appointment, you're not actually on the phone to have a conversation. I'm going to say something really controversial here, Marcus. Consultative selling does not work for prospecting. It's two completely different skill sets. Prospecting is asking for the date. Consultative selling is kind of going on the date. Asking the questions, getting to know the person, building the rapport, all the things you need to do. That's not prospecting. Prospecting is, what are you doing Saturday night? Would you like to have dinner? Mm -hmm. It is not, what are you doing Saturday night? Would you like to have dinner? And by the way, how many children do you want to have? And I'd like you to meet my family. When can I meet yours? And do you believe in long engagements? And what's your favorite color? That's not prospecting. <laughs> Save that for the date. Okay, that makes sense. And so when you open the conversation, how do you create the conditions so that the other person feels receptive and doesn't feel like you're stealing their time? Well, first of all, you do need to be brief. And if you think about prospecting, like dating, the goal, your goal is to set the appointment, which means the prospect agrees to have an in-depth conversation with you. It is not that the prospect agrees to dump their vendor and hire you or that they're going to pull out their credit card at the end of the conversation. It's really, it's very narrow. It's essentially you introduce yourself, 
you need a very strong value proposition, and we could talk about that. You introduce yourself by uh, talking about some of the uh, challenges that your clients have that you help them with. And you essentially say, I'd like to introduce myself and the product, the company, the service, and I need 15, 20 minutes of your time whenever it's good for you. That's essentially what you're doing. You're trying to introduce yourself. Once they say yes, then you can have that conversation. This is really very interesting. You talk about micro-targeted ICPs, and certainly I agree wholeheartedly. Now there is technology out there, tech like White Rabbit, for example, that allows you to identify before you dial who is who has a similar psychographic shape to your ideal prospect so that you can then start to identify those people within your prospect list. And then you can micro segment and clearly define on the basis of their particular interests and drivers. And when you do that, you suddenly increase the effectiveness of those calls by literally factors of hundreds, because now what you're doing is you're entering into their world, into a conversation, that feels relevant and timely to them instead of just showing up and peddling product. So in terms of developing that proposition, that value proposition to create a really strong 30-second commercial elevator, how do you go about doing that in such a way that puts the customer at the heart instead of you? Great question. There's a few ways that we do this. Um, One of the things we do in, in our program is we actually have participants in the program make a list of everything they do because salespeople like to talk about what they do. So we have them make a list. That's one column, make the list. Next column, how are your clients better off after you do that thing? That's the hard part. And we make them sit down and do that. We also um, will often have them interview existing clients because Salespeople, they want to talk about all the, all the great things they do, and they want to talk in their industry jargon. The problem is nobody cares what you do, and your prospects don't speak your industry jargon. So yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. So we have them interview clients about kind of before and after scenarios. What made you come to us? How did you, how did you feel about that? What was going on? How did you feel about what was going on? You came to us. Why? Mm-hmm. How do you feel about it now? Because I'm I'm looking for that language that it's emotional language that connects with that other human being that says, "Yeah, that's that's me." And I'll give I'll give you an example. Back before COVID, we were doing it's coming back now. We were doing a lot of work in commercial real estate, and um, I have somebody that does business development for me, and typically. In this industry, they'll hire new people, but the managers are so busy, they're running their own deals, and, and they don't really, most of them don't really love training the new hires. So our script went like this. We specialize in working with, plug in the correct title, executive managing directors in the commercial real estate industry that are sick of micromanaging junior brokers that aren't producing. When we got the right person on the phone and Tim would say that, they would laugh. And then they'd book an appointment with me. That was it. That's all we said. Because that's what they didn't want. They hated it. A lot of them. Some of them, you know, the ones that loved it, that wasn't a good target for us. But most of them Um, didn't. They didn't want to manage. Really interesting. Well, again, this then speaks to a really disastrous aspect of the way things have gone, um, which is that there doesn't really seem to be a management apprenticeship anymore. Literally now what happens is you get tapped on the shoulder and told, Wendy, we've just fired your idiot boss. You're now the idiot boss. Congratulations. And off you go. That's your runway. And so you do what was done to you or you do what you think is best without really understanding the underlying causes of your problems you're now also probably carrying the bag with your own target, as well as now having all this responsibility for people who 24 hours before were your equals. Now you're having to manage them. So 
my my question here is this around it's really around leadership why is it that leadership seems to have forgotten just how damn difficult it is to be really productive consistently as a prospector particularly now where you know we're talking 33 to 46 dial attempts just to get through to a decision maker yeah it's hard and the expectations are ludicrously un- unachievable in most cases. So what would you say to leaders? I think it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, which is this idea of the born salesperson. If leadership thinks that all they have to do is hire someone and they're going to figure it out, they're probably not going to figure it out. They may be very talented, but they're not going to figure it out on their own. But if that's your starting place, the mythology around sales that's like, oh, born with the gift of gab. Ah, he's a people person. So what? They, <laughs> you need people, your salespeople need to learn their craft, period. And so that means leaders need to take some responsibility. There are things that need to be put in place for when you hire someone that's brand new. You need that clear, let me take a step back. I mentioned before my first career, I was a dancer. I believe everything I know in life and business, I learned in ballet class. This is what I learned in ballet class. I call it the salesology prospecting model. If you're a dancer, you don't run out on stage and start dancing, you warm up. So you don't have a career ending injury. Mm -hmm. So what that means is if you're a sales leader, you need to have some things in place so your people can warm up so they don't hurt themselves and they don't hurt you and your bottom line. That means a clear definition of the target. We already talked about that. A clear definition of the process. When you say to somebody, go prospect, there are a lot of questions they have to answer. Who? How? Uh, Am I going to call? Am I going to email? Am I going to text? Am I going to use social media? What am I going to do? If I'm making phone calls, do I leave a voicemail? Do I, uh, how many? Do I send emails? How many? What's the frequency? Define it. And then you can benchmark it. You can measure it. You know what works. And then, as we've been discussing, you need scripts. Those are the three things you need to have in place to make salespeople uh, successful so that they can warm up and they don't hurt themselves and they don't hurt you and your bottom line. The next step in the model is, you know, if you're a dancer and you have a concert coming up, Again, you don't just run out on stage and start dancing. You've been rehearsing for months. Anna Pavlova trained for eight years at the Imperial Russian Ballet School before she joined the Imperial Russian Ballet. She learned her craft. That's what successful people do. And so what that means is your salespeople need to practice. It's not an intuitive skill set. Think how many talented athletes have never made it to the Olympics or played pro sports. They go to practice every day. They work with their coaches. That's what your salespeople need to do. Ballet dancers, we take class every single day. That's what your salespeople need to do. And it won't take them eight years. Then the third step in the model, we have warm-up, rehearse. Then you perform. The problem is most people just jump to the performance, which is why it doesn't work so well. And let me say one more thing about this performance and call reluctance, the elephant in the room. This is a lot like stage fright. And I have been there. You're waiting in the wings. You're waiting for your cue, your music. Your heart is pounding. Your palms are really sweaty. But then you hear your music and you get out on stage and you dance. Well, what enables you to do that? Well, you've warmed up so you're prepared. And you've rehearsed, so you have automatic muscle memory. You don't have to think about it. You can just execute. That's what enables you to get out on stage and dance. And what I have seen in all of the years that I have been doing this is that when people, new salespeople learn a very simple system and they know what they're going to do every step along the path and they have answers to their questions, there are no more, there's no, no unclear parts, they know what they're doing, then they can execute. And that call reluctance, for most people, it disappears. So I'd like to just dig a little bit into where the responsibility lies for sellers to develop, because 
I'm conscious that whilst logical for a company to invest, sometimes they don't have the money, often they don't have the inclination. One of my favorite acts of stupidity was the refrain, we hire veterans, they don't need training, which essentially was just um, uh, writing your, or signing your death warrant in invisible ink. And it's flabbergasts me how entitled many salespeople feel that their employer should do all the uh, the training. And I, I think we should be shifting the conversation towards learning and putting the responsibility back on the learner because ultimately they're the, the final and full beneficiary. And when the company makes that investment, that's fantastic. But if you want to get on, I put money on it. Anyone who made it into the Imperial Russian Ballet damn well wanted it and they fought yes. tooth and nail for it. Yes. And they weren't waiting for a leg up and there was no entitlement. They got the, you know, they got the broken toes. They got the blisters, the skin off their feet. And yeah, every body, every muscle in their body ached for year after year. That's how they got there. It wasn't because someone gave them a hand out. No, the dance world is cutthroat competitive. And and it's true. If you dance, you have to really want to dance. And if you want to be successful in sales, you have to really want to be successful in sales because it's, as we've said, it's not intuitive. Uh, it's not just going to happen on its own. And yes, management has responsibility to put things in place for their salespeople. But at the end of the day, if you are the salesperson and you're hungry and you want to be successful, you have to take action. It is about taking it is about taking action. And if you don't want to do that, then go find something else to do. Because there are, there are jobs out there where nine to five, people pay you a salary, you show up and do what you do and go home at the end of the day. But that's not really what we're talking about today. You have to have that drive, that passion. If we look at the mental resilience, the, the mindsets of great prospectors, how do they differ from the run of the mill, the average? I think the big thing is not accept that there is a good reason for someone to say no to you. If you are speaking with a qualified prospect, if they say something that disqualifies them by whatever your criteria are, then they're not a qualified prospect. But other than that, if you think, if your salespeople think there are good reasons for prospects to say no, that's not a mindset of a successful prospector. <laughs> I'll give you a personal example. When I got that day job all those years ago, and the day job, it was a, with a telemarketing agency. They did business to business, business development. And they gave me a script. They, I was really lucky. They trained me. And when I got a prospect on the phone, if they said they wouldn't book an appointment with the client, I thought they must not have missed it. They must not have understood. Because clearly, if they understood, they booked the appointment. And I was about 20 at the time. I didn't know anything about business. I was a dancer. So I would just start over. But that's, that's how I thought about it. It's just there's, there's no good reason to say no. Because remember, when you're prospecting, you're not saying, dump your vendor, hire us. You're saying, we'd like to introduce ourselves. We'd like to have a conversation with you about whatever the topic is. So why, why if you've targeted well and you've done your homework and you're talking to the right person and you have something of value to offer, why would they say no? And what I see a lot in, you know, when working with my clients, many of them, newer salespeople or, you know, the prospect says, well, I'm busy. And they go, oh, okay, click. I'm working with someone. Oh, okay, click. It's really interesting because I, th I think a lot of salespeople suffering from an internal monologue, first of all, catastrophizes. The expectation going into a call is that they're going to be given a hard time. They're going to struggle to get the person they need. If they do get to them, they won't want to take that call. And you're already setting yourself up massively for failure uh, just through that inner, um, you know, that inner script. And 
Um, so what do you teach people when it comes to managing their own internal voice? There are actually two things that I want to talk about here. Um, the first is there are the facts, and then there are the stories you tell yourself about the facts. <laughs> so the facts are you're going to dial the phone, you're going to reach someone, or you're not going to reach them. If you reach them, you're going to say something, they're going to say something. That's kind of it. <laughs> Those are the facts. The story is everything else. So when I'm working with a client, and they will often tell me these very elaborate stories about what this what complete stranger, stranger that they that talked they talk to, to for two for minutes, two. what this complete stranger was thinking, I will keep pushing back and saying, what did they actually say to you? <laughs> and, you know, oh, well, they said they really, you know, they don't have any need and well, what did they actually say? <laughs> you know? Well, they're just too busy right now because it's the holidays. Well, what did they actually say to you? And it, it turns out they said something like, well, I can't talk now, but if you call me after uh, January 1st, we can talk. <laughs> right. so, so they've got these elaborate stories. So I always want people like, what are the facts? Let's, let's start this based on fact. What did they say? And the other thing is, that whatever it is they say, this is data. We talked earlier about prospecting is not an emotional experience. I mean, think about how many of your emails get deleted. You hit send, they delete your emails. So you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Of course you're not. So same thing here, not an emotional experience. This is data. So if everybody that you talk to has a negative reaction, they are reacting to what you are saying. What a lot of people do is they go, oh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work for us. This doesn't work in our industry. No, you say, okay, this script isn't working. Let's revise it. It's data. It enables you to come up with the approach, the introduction that's going to resonate. So they say, oh, okay, yeah, I want to talk to you. Well, a couple of observations. I, I, I've come across so many organizations that haven't altered their ideal customer profile in five, even 10 or many uh, more years. And they haven't paid any attention to how their market has shifted subtly or quite significantly. Uh, and as a result, they're wasting a huge amount of time. The other thing that I see, which seems incredibly wasteful and they're misplaced, is that the people, the most senior people, are not the ones building the list. And I think that's, again, another really important aspect in terms of the quality of the data that you're giving to your salespeople uh, to use. Because uh, otherwise, in the average amount of time that a sales development rep, an SDR, is spending speaking to customers is three minutes out of the 480 you pay them for every day. That's the average. And often, it's not only that you've got a terrible script and a bad approach, but your data is awful. So what advice would you give and direction would you give to management and leadership around the building and maintenance of that list? The list is foundational. And when we, when we work with a client, that's, that's where we start is the definition, that very clear micro-targeted definition of an ideal prospect. And telemarketing 101, it's about the list. So that information needs to be solid for the SDRs. Now, here, here's the other thing. When I started my business 25 years ago, and I had clients that I'd represent, I did business development for them, they would give me a book. They'd say, here you go. <laughs> and, you know, they would have company names and the switchboard number and like no names. So the person, I'd have to figure out who it is and get to the person I wanted to talk to. It's not like that now. The data is available. There are tools available to get accurate information. You should take advantage of it. And there are other tools like it completely amazes me how in 2021, almost 2022, there are still so many companies, they're not using any kind of software to manage their prospecting. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this on an Excel spreadsheet doesn't matter how smart you are. You just can't do it. And you need a dialer. And these are tools 25 years ago. We we're dialing, you know, 
<laughs> dialing by hand. Manually. Like, well, you, yeah. you can only do 15 dials an hour that way. Yeah. An yeah. And the dialer, uh, I mean, we use uh, software that doubled the call volume. And then when we added a dialer, it went up another 50%. So call volume is, is really high. And it enables you to drop voicemails because we get some of these people to return phone calls and respond to emails. It's interesting. And I was watching a debate um, in one of the forums that I'm in. And there was a very strong consensus from uh, some very successful telemarketers that leaving voicemail was uh, not a great strategy. Now, I've had success with it, but I'm really curious about what makes a good, interesting, and compelling uh, voicemail that makes someone want to call back. How do you craft one of them? Well, the same way you craft your script. What's the problem that they have that you can help them with? And how do they talk about it? And you can also include, I am a big believer in storytelling. So... You can give an example. It has to be short because you don't have a lot of time on a, on a voicemail. But if your client has a problem, if there's a problem that you solve for clients and you could give an example, we worked with this client, they had this problem, Here was we fixed it, that can be very powerful. And we do a voicemail campaign, which is a series of messages that you leave it over time. And it's voicemail and it's email. Um, people will often say to me, well, Wendy, you know, people don't answer their phone, so is an email better? There is actual research, it was done at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, that they tested spoken communication against written communication. So spoken communication is... When you're face to face, you're in the same room with someone. It could be on a Zoom call. It could be on a phone call. It could be a voicemail. They tested that against written communication, a text, an email, a social media post, a letter. And what they found is two things. If people hear you talk, even if it's only on a voicemail, one, they think you're smarter. And two, they're more likely to take action on whatever it is you're talking about. So. What we do, what I recommend is we leave the voicemail and then we also send an email. And what we've seen, we've seen it internally. I've seen it with my clients. Most prospects that respond do respond to the email. But as soon as we stop leaving the voicemail, the response rate goes down. So we do both. By roughly how much? Just out of curiosity? At least 50%. Wow. The whole idea of only having one channel to surround a prospect. And, and a lot of the work that I do is around strategic alliances or um, you know, big ticket enterprise. And we know that in most of these organizations, there's between eight and 12 decision makers. And we're seeing in enterprise, it's around 10.9 at the moment per decision. So per, per buying cycle. So what I'm really curious about is why so few organizations systematically prospect to surround the account and use the SDR function in that way so that they can go deep and wide within the orga uh, an organization. And instead, they just go after one or two job titles and spread themselves terribly thin without ever creating true relationship uh, with the, uh, the stakeholders within that business. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting about this voicemail campaign idea that I was just describing is lots of times when you've left done this voicemail campaign, and we usually we usually start with four voicemails, four emails, because the research shows it's typically going to take eight to 12 touches to get a response. So we start with eight and we track it. We might need to add more. But what happens over time, even if someone is non-responsive, when they do respond or when you do get them on the phone, they know who you are. They know uh, it, it's like the, you've kind of started to develop this relationship just by leaving them, them the voicemails and sending the emails. So that, that's the first thing. And then the 
other thing is that when we're uh, when there are multiple stakeholders, we'll generally say, okay, start at the top, go through the cycle with whoever is the top, and then just keep working your way down. Because what's going to happen is we recycle. You do the four voicemails and four emails. Yep. And depending on how many leads you have, if they're non-responsive, you just recycle them three months, six months, a year out and start over. So then, if well, you're going is, down, you yeah. then, if, let's say you've gone through the list and nobody responds, you start back at the top. So it's, it's a way of continually reaching out to that account until you are able to penetrate it a little bit. Well, th this is really interesting because with the white rabbit technology, we're now able to provide a prioritized lead list on the basis of whom amongst that cast of characters is likely to be positively responsive to a, a sales call from one of your reps. And so you can then choreograph the sequence with which you target people on the basis of their probability to be receptive. Now, the beauty of that is you don't then end up getting blocked by contacting someone who's um, very likely to be unreceptive or even overtly hostile. You, get, you surround them with you know, five or six people who are going to be positively responsive. And then you uh, target the job title that really matters. And I think because so many organizations are operating on this quarterly reporting cycle, and you know, what can we do to get it in this month, this quarter, they don't really play a long game when it comes to prospecting. So in wrapping up, what I'd love to do is uh, get your thoughts in terms of prospecting for the medium to long-term pipeline and playing that long game. Yeah, well, you certainly have to take a look at how long your sales cycle is. If your sales cycle is years, you can't expect that somebody that is prospecting today is going to close one of those deals before the end of the first quarter. It's just not going to happen if you have a three-year sales cycle. So you, you do have to take the long view and, and push that out because all that, all that does is put a lot of pressure on the sales rep who can't, you're setting up an impossible situation for them. They're not closing a deal. If they set an appointment today for January 5th, they're not closing that deal by the end of the month if you or by the end of the first quarter if you have a three year sales cycle. It's not happening. Absolutely. So I'm very curious uh, about one other thing actually. A lot of the technology companies, well, in fact, so over 70% of all products sold on the planet today go through channels. They go through licensees, franchisees, uh, resellers, systems integrators, managed service providers, distribution, retailers, all that kind of stuff. But almost no vendors really treat, uh, well, a very small proportion of um, vendors really treat their channel as if they are their best customer. And I'm very curious to see if you're seeing any trends out in the market where vendors are starting to work with their partners, helping them build their pipeline, investing in building the partner's brand and helping them sell their entire portfolio and building their pipeline so that they're successful. I'm curious if you're seeing any of that happening out in the market. Not enough. I mean, it, it, it's surprising that type of channel partnership. You could almost describe it as the low-hanging fruit. It's, it's there. So rather than being that warrior going out on your own uh, to have a partnership that's really a partnership to work together for mutual benefit seems it would be so much easier. And yet I'm not seeing that a lot. I'm with you hundred percent. I mean, if you sell hot all the time, instead of sell cold, you have a six to 14 to 18 times higher close rate. Your sales cycles are at least half as long. Average initial order is two and a half to three and a half times higher the referral rate is at least four times higher. And yet everybody seems to be fixated on prospecting the cold market instead of prospecting the hot market. So in finishing, what I'd really love your thoughts is some you know, final words of wisdom for people to maybe rethink the way they go to market, the way they approach prospecting. What, what advice would you give to maybe uh, see, see the, rip the scales from their eyes? <laughs> well, the first question that you should be asking yourself is, and, and we've been talking about this 
the whole interview, but, you know, what are these challenges that your prospects have that you can help them with? And then how do they talk about it? That's your foundational, that's your core message. Yeah. And then you take a look around and you say, well, okay, who, who is serving that same market? Either reseller, you're a distributor, you're a franchise, or simply who can we partner with because they have clients, slightly different problem, but related. And so we could partner to serve that market as well. Um, and, and so those are two distinct but important steps that I'd recommend all of our listeners, our watchers take today. It's like, what's the problem? How do they talk about it? And then who else is serving this market that I can partner with to make my life easier? Interesting. Okay, so you have a golden ticket and you can go back and whisper in the ear of the idiot when the age 23, when you thought you were immortal, invincible, and you knew everything. What one choice bit of advice would you whisper in her ear? I would whisper that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and when I started my business, and I was actually older than 23 when I started my business, but nonetheless, I'd been dancing. And I thought, dancing is the hardest thing I will ever do in my life. Everything else has to be easier, which, which has been true. And I knew I was smart and I did like to read. And I thought, you know, I could figure this out. And I started my own business. And along the way, I made a lot of mistakes. And they were completely <laughs> preventable mistakes, things, you know, because you don't know what you don't know until, <laughs> until it slaps you in the face. Hey, Wendy, yep. you didn't know this. You should have known about this. So the advice that I would give to my 23-year-old self and to anyone that's thinking about starting a business is do get some expert advice. Get expert help. Absolutely. My favorite question whenever I have a problem is who has fixed this already? Um, right. And then go straight to the source. Yeah. And th there is no point beating your head against the wall trying to reinvent the wheel when you can shortcut it and use your intellect on something more important. Yeah. And I didn't even know the questions to ask myself because I was a ballet dancer. I didn't know anything about business. I just, you know, said, oh, I'm going to do this. What was your best mistake in business? I think I just told you my, my best okay. mistake. Well, that, maybe that was my worst mistake in business. Yeah. What was the best one that you learned the most from? What I learned the most from, I'll go back to my dance career. I feel that so much in my, in my business, my life, I learned in ballet class. And what I learned was to keep moving forward. And, you know, I'm not saying that my business, that there have been setbacks or disappointments or anything like that. In ballet, you have a terrible class or a terrible performance and you beat yourself up and then you go take class the next day because you have a performance that night. So I think the most important thing that I have done fairly consistently and fairly successfully throughout is when something happens that, gee, that's not what I wanted. That was not the outcome I was looking for. I'm really sorry that happened. It might take me a little bit of time, but I regroup and I, and I move forward because that's what you have to do. Excellent. Wendy, this has been an absolute joy. Thank you. How can people get hold of you? Well, I invite everyone. We have a gift for all of the audience today, uh, which is actually two guides. The first guide is the Cold Calling Survival Guide, and the subtitle is Start Setting Appointments in the Next 24 Hours. And that is for, if you, for you if you're a salesperson and you're making prospecting calls. It's also for you if you're um, a manager and you want to know what to have in place for your people that are making prospecting calls. And then the second guide is called the Business Owner's Guide to Scheduling More Qualified Appointments When Our Prospects Are All Completely Freaking Out. And that was written for the times that we live in. It is 12 actionable steps that you can take to drive sales today. And um, I believe you're going to post that with this recording. Yeah, it's, it'll, be in the, it'll be in the show notes. 
Okay, wonderful. And uh, contact you, website, email? Coldcallingresults.com is the website. And you can email info or Wendy at coldcallingresults.com. You can also call me if you're in the U.S. or Canada. I am a phone person, 866-220-4242. Actually, you could call me any, from any place with that phone number, actually. With a plus one. <laughs> with a plus one, yes. 866-220-4242. I do return phone calls. Wendy Weiss, thank you. Thank you. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful, then please go back, listen again, take notes, tag someone who would benefit from listening to it. And if you feel the urge, uh, then please comment. Get in touch with Wendy or myself about the whole concept of uh, prospecting and what you need to do in your world. And if you'd like to get hold of me, marcusas.com, direct message me on LinkedIn, connect. And if you feel the urge, go to Apple Podcasts, scroll below the fold, and leave an honest review. You can be rude about me. I won't be offended. Uh, In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.